This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters. Okay, we're back. We're live. 2 p.m. block. 2, 2 p.m. block. Rock. What have you? I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and my special guest is uh, Cy Weiss. He's the Energy Committee Co-Chair uh, at the Sierra Club for Oahu. Welcome, Cy. Thanks for having me. Jay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to have you here. We've been, you know, we've been touching on this issue since we talked last week, and it's really important. Let's, we're calling it um, here on leadership, uh, making leadership work. We're calling it blockchain um, is what much more than just bitcoins because yeah. it's associated with bitcoins. And, uh, and the message to take home is if you're not looking, if you as an entrepreneur are not looking at blockchain technology, you're not innovating hard enough. I took your words. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So anyway, uh, we're talking about blockchain today. And we're talking about what it can do for us, talking about uh, what it can do for us, not only in, in currency and bitcoins, uh, but in so many other things, uh, in making decisions, uh, in doing real-time decisions, in managing our society, uh, and of course, in managing energy as a critical part of our society. And it's just emerging now. It's, 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 you know, it's kind of, it, it, it snuck up on us. It snuck up through Bitcoins. Right. And now we find that inherent in Bitcoins is the kind of technology that could run so many other things. So let me begin by asking, you know, what is uh, blockchain and how does it relate to Bitcoins and how does it relate to artificial intelligence, which we keep hearing about? So blockchain is a database that stores uh, it's a public ledger that it's decentralized that stores information um, and transactions and it can be utilized in any technology um, that has uh, buying and selling or uh, you know something like smart contracts that requires some kind of um, input and output so that suggests that um, a um, it's a learning it's like artificial intelligence is learning so blockchain is learning and the database is uh, always uh, uh, getting new information uh, and becoming more, more intelligent, more smarter all the time. Uh, and that's perfect for a market because in a market you have to handle all the influences, all the vectors, all the facts and circumstances and come up with some kind of solution. Uh, it sounds very powerful because markets are very powerful. Right, so this technology can be utilized in let's say a market condition in what we saw the rise of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to where it decentralizes it and makes it to where it democratizes uh, a currency to where it is not controlled by some kind of central power like a uh, either bank or government or institution. Mm -hmm. So it really puts the power in people's hands and that's why we saw the rise of Bitcoin and what we saw with, I think it's around almost, it's, it's around 2000 something dollars per Bitcoin, you know, it's fluctuating. Um, it's gone down a little bit recently, but Nonetheless, it's still a powerful uh, currency that is used um, on the internet. Yeah, one thing that strikes me from what you said is that democratization, this is really powerful stuff to have a democratized currency where nobody's actually manipulating it, I don't think, uh, where you know, nobody's actually controlling it, no central bank, no nobody. It's just reflective of the human condition, the human marketplace which makes it, by, by definition, a democratic experience. This, this is, am I right? This has never happened before in any context. Right, I mean, this is thanks to the internet and the ability for, you know, the ability for like me being able to, to talk to you or transact with you from any part of the world as long as I have internet connection has enabled everyone to become on this, you know, to be a part of a marketplace that enables people to buy and sell goods that you wouldn't normally have been able to do before if you didn't have some kind of mode of transportation mm -hmm. so or some form of communication that you know went beyond just talking or speaking with the person over the telephone so what what in fact does blockchain do for bitcoins how does it how does it act in the bitcoin experience right so there's in the bitcoin experience there's the blockchain, which is basically the backbone of Bitcoins to where it creates a public ledger of where everyone can see, and it's, and it's anonymous, but some argue that it is not truly anonymous, your identity on the ledger. But nonetheless, it enables a person to, to, to view the transactions in real time of where these coins are going. And the difference between 
uh, cryptocurrency and specifically Bitcoin compared to uh, the dollar, for example, is it's infinitely divisible. So I could give you 0. 0.00013 of a bit. Yeah, exactly. Of, of a Bitcoin rather than, you know, having to give you, you know, some loose change that I could give you in your pocket. That's not, inf you know, infinitely divisible. Mm. So, so <clears throat> Bitcoin is, is uh, obviously um, becoming more important these days, uh, maybe for the reason that you just described. But I mean, I wonder about this the whole thing with the backbone and the and the let the ledger, the database. You know, if if humankind can build it, then human humankind can open it up again. I mean, even Apple with all its uh, you know secret al algorithms. You know, there's ways to crack that code, uh -huh. and there's white hats and black hats and people who can crack what the other guy did. Um, so if the information about you and me in this backbone and the blockchain background is in there somewhere. And can, could, couldn't a third person get into it? So, and that's a great question. And that's something that, you know, programmers and people on the, in, on the internet are arguing over, you know, on a daily basis. How do we create an ecosystem that is fully transparent, that, you know, mitigates or gets rid of fraud um, and is something that is secure? And that's going to take time. You know, it's not going to be something that happens overnight. You know, blockchain is or excuse me, Bitcoin is the first of, of the cryptocurrency world to really take off. And there's other, there's other forms of the blockchain technology in the cryptocurrency world that are currently evolving. So, you know, it's something that is evolving and that we down the road will later find out what system doesn't work and what system is going to work. At the end of the day, though, we realize that programming and having some kind of open source technology where people can see how the program is being developed is essential in making sure that the whole system functions democratically Democratic and, and, and that it's decentralized. Yeah. So the, the, the main point of this technology is the decentralization of power. So you want to give it to the people rather than some kind of central entity that would control the, the flow of, of that currency. Well, what I hear you saying is that the kernel of it, the essence of it, the part that is highly sensitive, the part that maybe controls information we don't we don't want to be public it's, it's 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 part of the market analysis but we don't want it to get out um that's going to be secret by virtue of what open source coding except none of the open source coders can actually get in to see it i mean is there going to be some little room down a back street <laughs> you know called blockchain corporation where some guy in thick glasses is sitting there and he can control it or will no one ever control it and that's that's a that's you know that's something that we're going to find out. Um, currently, as it stands, it's you know people meet in a physical location and discuss around how the technology should move forward, and specifically you know the Bitcoin blockchain. So now there's something going on with uh, Bitcoins and Bitcoin Cash, where the where the coin has now been split in two. So. You know, they're, they're, it's evolving. It's something that's not, you know, set in stone overnight, and this is the way it's going to be moving forward forever. It's something that's evolving. And I think as we move down further on in the technology, I think we will see some kind of uh, solidified consensus on how the tech, exactly how blockchain should work. So it sounds like open source in general. Nobody necessarily makes any money by evolving it, but, but the net effect can be useful in different uh, contexts. Right, but people are actually making a lot of money well, off they, of Bitcoin. By yeah. trading Bitcoin. Exactly. But by, not necessarily by doing open source coding for, for the, the, the that's, blockchain. That's correct. But then there are things like um, ICOs, which are called initial coin offerings, mm -hmm. where an entity or a company or a group of people or even a single person could come out and say, this is a currency that I've developed for X reason, and um, I am putting it out there to, you know, fulfill some kind of goal or, you know, there's some attachment to, to that currency. So there, I mean, there are, there are different ways of its evolving. For example, there's something called, uh, you know, uh, solar coin where it pays you on how much solar energy you're producing. Um, like based solar on solar panels. Or something. Exactly. So there's, it's attached to your meter and then that's a verification of proof of work. Then you're now then given, um, a token or a coin for that work that you did. So let's say someone in uh, 
you know, in the middle of India that has a coal-fired power plant wants to say, we want to offset our carbon footprint, we're going to buy these, carb these solar coins from this person to offset what we're, um, you know, sending off into that. So yeah. it sounds like from what you say is that it, it's, it's as useful in a market situation and it's also useful in making decisions around a market situation. Mm -hmm. P.S. I stumbled into Eddie mm -hmm. Murphy's movie last night, Trading Places. I think it was back in the 70s, the early 80s. It's hysterical. It is a classic movie. And it is about cornering the market on orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it shows you how you can do that. But, you know, I, I suggest to you that this kind of software, this kind of you know, backbone uh, database, learning database, can, can deal in any market, mm -hmm. including orange juice. So I could use this, I could use this software to corner the market on orange juice. It's just the way uh, the guys try to do in the movie. You know? Exactly. I mean, to even it, let's say you wanted or purely organic orange juice, right? And you and you wanted to look at. Where is this coming from? Are they actually producing it organically? Because nowadays people can just slamp on a, you know, an organic label. There's, there's a slew of different organizations that will, quote, you know, certify organically your pro you know, certify organic, you know, um, label your product. So a blockchain, what it would enable to do is some kind of contract to show you, like, okay, this farmer didn't use these pesticides, use this farming method, therefore it is actually um, bona fide, you know, organic orange juice. So that's where the technology could come in and you could say, well, now I can go to the store and pay, you know, using your cryptocurrency for that organic <laughs> orange juice and theoretically corner the entire or cannibalize the entire market because you now consumers know you are a true producer of organic ah, orange juice. Ah, and that goes to what you were talking about before the show, trust. Yes. Because you have to build into this system trust where people trust it and it is trustworthy. Right. Um, how exactly do you do that? So. And in terms of how do we create uh, the blockchain to be trustful? Is that is, yeah, trustworthy, is that... right? Trustworthy. In other words, okay, I'm I'm surrendering my decision process, okay. my market evaluation, whatever it is, to the blockchain technology, um, and, and and I think this will happen more and more going forward. Uh, how do I how do, how do you make this technology trustworthy for me and make me trust it? Well, the technology itself isn't reliant on emotion. You know, as humans, we are emotional creatures. So the technology itself is going to be purely on logic. So if X happens, it's going to go into a direction of Y. You know, if 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 A happens, then you know uh, we need to work. It, it, the the machine's going to work in the direction of B because of what happened in in um, with with that. So I think that the whole idea of getting back to as we as humans have a distrust for each other, and that's why blockchain is going to thrive is because we can trust a machine, a software, then I can trust, you know, you, for example. Of course I trust you, but I'm saying, like, as another human being, there is a mutual distrust that we have with each other, which makes blockchain flourish. And especially now in the future, we're going to be not only transacting with other humans from across the world, right? Once we do have, you know, more people from, uh, you know, developing countries hopping onto the, to the, to, to the internet, but in addition, we're going to be communicating with machines, yeah. and I think that's going to be, you know, a big, a big thing for blockchain is we're going to be enabling the processing of machines and human transactions. Yeah, well, it's it's really interesting. I, I was telling you also that, you know, from the time I started practicing and saw computers emerging way back in the 70s, I guess it was, uh, personal computers and the you know the availability of computers and programming to the average person. I thought that um, why not have computers and this kind of technology actually answer legal questions? Well, we have that, really. Uh, why not have this technology make legal decisions like judges do or juries do? And I mean, there's a certain concern that in the law is built in this notion of humanity. And sometimes there are value judgments that are, that are, not, that are not as good if they're totally logical. And maybe the human condition requires something illogical to function. I, I, I resist that because I actually believe that if you could, if you could make decisions logical all the time, you wouldn't need to crank in human emotion. You know, human emotion actually may be a negative factor factor in making a clear-cut decision. So if you accept my point of view, then you can make the decisions judges make maybe better. You can make the decisions juries make maybe better. Feed them all the facts um, and let them learn. 
uh, you can and you re rely on precedent, whatever it is. You can make legislators, legislation, legis legislators, legislation, legislatures make good laws, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so forth. I mean, every branch of government, including those branches that are, are called on uh, to do discretionary things, like the executive branch, mm -hmm. you can have them make better, more logical decisions. In fact, you could run our whole society. It's more than just practicing law or practicing justice. It's everything ultimately can be done by this kind of um, blockchain, artificial intelligence kind of analysis of things. It's going to change our world. Um, and, and, and of course, in the process, it'll change essential elements of our world. Will the world be better, Sai? Uh, I, th I think so. I think it will, will, it will help improve our world. We wouldn't actually have I personally think as many lawsuits because of the idea of being able to trust a ledger rather than the emotions of another human being. But to also add to your, your um, analogy of using the blockchain in government is actually Dubai is proposed by 2020, they want to put all their government paperwork on the blockchain. Little, little box about that big. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there's already governments moving that direction. The private sector has already been jumping on utilizing blockchains and as you, know, as you said at the earlier earlier in the show, you know, if you're not looking into blockchain in, in, to, in, your, in your company, you're not innovating hard enough. Yeah. So, you know, there, it's something that is not going to happen, you know, exactly right away in the marketplace. It's going to be some, you know, some odd number of decades, but it's going to be something that's inevitable that will be coming down the pipeline in terms of how we as a society are going to function. So I think we can join together on this piece of advice. Forget about plastics. Don't go into plastics, young man or woman. <laughs> Go into blockchain. And for now, let's have a break. We'll come back in a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. My friend, mother, what big eyes you have, she said. All the better to see you with, my dear. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the starting line. Push. Uh, when this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Okay, we're back on uh, making leadership work here in Hawaii, talking about uh, blockchain. Blockchain is uh, not just for Bitcoins. And uh, our special guest is uh, Cy Weiss. He's the member of the Energy Committee, a, a co-chair of the Energy Committee at the Sierra Club, Oahu. And we're talking about leadership. So what's, what's the relationship, hmm? okay, <laughs> of, bit, of Bitcoins and, and uh, blockchain with leadership? I think in leadership, people are going to have to look at utilizing this technology and convincing companies before, you know, the end of their company is that you have to be innovating with blockchain. Because if you're not, then someone else is going to do it. And in that case, you're going to have to change your business model before company B comes in and takes, takes over. So in leadership, I think it's you know, our, our duty as, as entrepreneurs is to look at ways we can integrate this into society. Yeah, yeah in, in um, uh, Thomas Friedman's new book, uh, Thanks for Being Late, he talks about accelerations, accelerators in our world today. And one of them, of course, is technology moves faster all the time. It strikes me from what you say that it's, it's not an option. If you are a young executive, or if you're an executive, period, um, and if you are an entrepreneur, period, you have to follow the new technologies, especially when you consider how fast they move. If you lose out on something like blockchain, you can't catch up. You're mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. You will not succeed in this market. You will not succeed against the accelerating forces all around us. So we talked also about what the low-hanging fruit would be. I mean, yes, law and government and business in general and finance. who knows finance. Yeah. yeah, that's perfect there. It's all numbers, yeah. Um, but we also talked about energy, and I, that's why you and Sierra Club have, 
have wrapped around on this issue. So what's the connection between blockchain uh, and energy? So the, as, as blockchain has helped to decentralize, well, let's, let's pedal back a little bit. As blockchain has helped cryptocurrencies and helped it decentralize kind of the finance world, I think that blockchain can be utilized in energy and help to decentralize and democratize energy. Um, and hopefully here in Hawaii, we could, we could be a test bed for something like that. So how do you do it? Well, it's going to take innovation in terms of developing the correct algorithms and the software and then ultimately convincing you know, our monopoly utility to get on board and to start utilizing this technology. Because ultimately, we want to create an ecosystem where we can work alongside the utility and where rooftop solar and battery storage can decentralize power, can work and actually be a net benefit um, for our society and the utility business model. So um, I think that would be a win-win for everybody, the utility, the homeowner, and for even our environment with reducing our carbon footprint by incentivizing more PV and battery storage. Okay, so um, if I'm the utility and I see this, I accept this vision, uh, what do I do first? Now we're talking about energy, we're talking about balancing loads, we're talking about storage versus uh, solar generation. We're talking about um, you know taking a whole big system and um, kind of uh, harm harmonizing it and mm -hmm. looking at the markets of each one of these balances or imbalances and making them all work totally together using something like this kind of blockchain algorithm. How do I start that out? So what do I do? I call you up. What do I do? <laughs> so actually, this is where the entrepreneurs can dive in. So the entrepreneur, for example, can set up a company. Uh, primarily, I think in the first phase, it would be consulting the utility about this technology and why it's important. There's com you know there's uh, organizations already in the U.S. that are working around it. In Brooklyn, for example, there is a microgrid that is working alongside yeah. with um, the utility over there to help enable homeowners to buy and sell, literally buy and sell power from your neighbor um, and be able to um, enhance the reliability of the grid. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's it's, reminiscent of Wheeling in Texas. Yeah. Right. So and that's and that's I think I think that's and you brought up a great point Jay, is that we need to look at Wheeling because this is in a essence not really Wheeling, but it is similar, very similar to Wheeling where you're allowing the, the, the use of transmission lines and selling power to another entity, to another entity ultimately, and that's where uh, you know we have to help the utility understand that wheeling is something that is necessary, and that's going to actually accelerate and help us get to that 100% renewable energy goal by 2045. I keep thinking of the uh, the, the old thing about um, um, the what is it H H O V lanes or H O T lanes, whatever it is. Uh, where the, the, you know if you if you want to get on this fast lane in the highway, um, you pay more, and and uh, you, but uh, it depends on how many people are already on the lane. So if the lane's crowded, your price goes up per mile per whatever it is, and it's all automatically billed. Of course, you know as you pass by in Singapore, it's sort of automatically billed on a credit card basis. Uh, and if there are very few people on that lane, then your price goes down. And it's an algorithm that changes the price, and the price changes all the time. It is real time. And I think what I hear you saying is that, is that if you apply this to uh, balancing the, the grid uh, and, and establishing by algorithm the charges that people would pay for energy or people would get for supplying energy into the grid, um, it's real time. It, oh. it doesn't have to be fixed. It doesn't have to be in a tariff. It's just the way the market works, and the work, it works instantly with this kind of Bitcoin rather uh, uh, blockchain technology. No? Right, right. So like, for example, if you had, you know, your home in, uh, let's say, Kailua, and you were producing panel, or excuse me, you're producing power during the day from your solar panels, and, um, you know, you're at work, right, here in the studio, you could theoretically be making money at that point seamlessly depending on what the utility would accept for that, uh, for that rate of energy. So right now we have a system called the energy metering, which no longer exists. Which well, actually, NEM, yeah, 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 which no longer exists. Now we have something called consumer self-supply. But this all begs the question: Is 
what do we are what are we going to price this type of power into the grid? And so if we create a system alongside with blockchain with the parameters of accepting power at this time of the day at a certain price, right. then we can establish a marketplace where there's we create prosumers where we create a marketplace where people can produce and consume and sell power to the neighbors or a uh, you know a company that is nearby that needs that excess power during the day or night. Yeah. So um, I think it's going to enable to create an ecosystem that democratizes energy so that you and I can participate in the buying and selling of power. Yeah, and it also incentivizes and de-incentivizes certain kinds of conduct that's desired or not. For example, um, you know, if you wanted to balance, um, you know, at, at night, um, you would charge one rate because it's at night, and you feed this in to the block the blockchain. So uh -huh. you're incentivizing or de-incentivizing, and, and changing the way the community works. But here, I, I'd like to, you know, give you a challenge question. Okay. Okay. I mean. We, we, we talked earlier about the challenges in, in, in making any democratized open source system is you can have black hats and, and they could do bad things to it. You could have equipment failures and that could get in the way. Um, there, there are challenges with any sort of totally centralized system. But talking about the marketplace aspect of it, okay? So I submit to the rates that are established by the algorithm with all of the influences and vectors and, you know, forces that are built into that making of that algorithm. Um, but I don't know exactly what the rate's going to be at a given time or a given day. I don't know how the market's going to actually conduct itself. Um, and therefore, in business as an entrepreneur, we're talking about leadership, um, I can't plan. I, can't, I don't know what's going to happen. So it, it strikes me that there's, there's a missing link there if I submit, you know, to this algorithm that has all these factors and this sort of intelligence that goes beyond what I could figure out, um, and I, I am at, at, its, at, its, at its whim, um, I'm at its mercy, and therefore, you know, making my budget, for example, on the cost of electricity to run my business, I may just not know. And the question I put to you is, so what do I do? I, I get my own. I get my own uh, uh, blockchain, and I and I try to anticipate. <laughs> I'm just throwing this out yeah. at you. I try to anticipate what what the, the democratized blockchain is going to do. I may not be perfectly accurate about that, but at least I can budget. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I I think I think there are going to be, you know, opportunities for people to create their own blockchain. I I definitely see that down the road where there will be some kind of program that will let you put in certain parameters to develop some kind of blockchain. And let's say you created a family blockchain. Let's say you, with your relatives, have created some kind of currency, intermodal currency, where you get to use that currency for some kind of family affair or some kind of you know, transaction that you would want to conduct. Um, but getting back to the, the whim of the technology and what's going to happen, I think that's going to happen with what we're going to have to talk about as society is that the regulations around this kind of technology in the marketplace, what are the price of certain technologies on the grid? Um, and I think that's something that we're arguing about today, you know? Um, what is the value of solar on the grid? What is the value of battery storage? And I think further down the road, we're gonna figure that out. And blockchain technology will help enable uh, the transactions of those electrons and the buying and selling of power much more efficiently, faster, and it'll be more secure. Uh, the kind of uh, concerns that people have about it is, well, you know, what's going to happen with price? I think we're going to find out what price is most effective in the marketplace um, over time. It's no, it, this is something that is so new, so you know, bleeding edge, that we're still trying to figure out how to integrate it even in our economy. Yeah. Uh, but you know, with the project with Grid Plus and um, with the Brooklyn uh, microgrid project with utilizing blockchain and solar and uh, battery storage in, in that neighborhood in, in Brooklyn, I think that that's one step further. And there are utilities already looking at it. I mean, it's not something that's you know, some idea that's a pie in the sky kind of, kind of thing. It's something that's really being looked at. You know, there are there's actually a nonprofit foundation. I forgot the name of the organization right off the, it's on the tip of my tongue, but 
nonetheless, there are Fortune 500 companies that are investing into trying to utilize this in their business because they know it's inevitable. It's something that's going to be coming down the line, and then they gotta, you know, either adapt or they they're gonna they're gonna fail. Yeah. So I think with time, with understanding and educating people and and different entities around blockchain, we're gonna see it fully be integrated into society. And 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 ultimately with energy, it's gonna help incentivize. I think it's going to help incentivize renewable energy on the grid because we're going to be able to let people, you know, purchase and store and sell to the utility their excess power. Yeah, and in Hawaii, where we're so conscious of energy and clean energy, uh, we, could, we could build a system to put the applicable regulations into this box, so to speak. Um, we could put, uh, you know, the market influences in there. We could like the sensors, you know, that you spoke of. I mean, we could, we could put all the information we need in order to, for the thing to negotiate the market uh, and come up with a price and to come up with, with, with signals to the elements in the, in the grid structure uh -huh. uh, to, to make it work most efficiently. And once we've done that, we will ma have made a huge contribution to the development of clean energy in Hawaii and the development of the grid, which we need to do, for mm -hmm. sure. But then there's one more point, and that is the point about um, about learning from that. And, and so that's the low-hanging fruit, seems to me, in energy. But once we learn how to do that, once we evolve with that, once we bring all these factors together and have the thing decide, we can apply it to other parts of the human experience, other parts of our society. And ultimately, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you call it, artificial intelligence uh -huh. or blockchain, whatever it is, <clears throat> it will emerge as a a significant feature in making our society more rational, more efficient, more productive, more prosperous, more happy. <laughs> well, that's what we all want, eh, is to be more happy. I think that's the ultimate experience. So what's your, what's your message to the people at the end here? Let's see. Why don't you talk through that camera over there and uh, that one and, and tell them what you would like to leave with them today, Sai. Well, I would like to leave with them the idea that blockchain shouldn't be something that is intimidating or scary or too hard to understand. There are a lot of videos on the web that explain what the technology is. And I think most of us right now, uh, we have to educate ourselves around understanding this technology and how it's going to be integrated into today's economy and tomorrow's economy as well. And that it's something that's inevitable. We have to you know, look at how this technology is going to benefit us as society and be able to adapt around it because at the end of the day it's going to be something that is going to happen whether we like it or not yeah let's have it happen here yeah let's let's, let's we could start you know since we do have the highest um solar a rooftop solar penetration per capita in the entire nation you know we're ripe for something like testing a you know blockchain powered microgrid and you know we could we could innovate something and use that data to to then put on a wider scale here in the islands. I think yeah. that's something yeah. we could bring the utility involved. And I think the utility shouldn't be intimidated and say, oh, well, this is going to end our business. I think it's not going to end their business, so, so to say, as the utility, but it's going to change their business model. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how to innovate and how to become, be prosperous in the future and be able to, you know, have a win-win and have everyone be stoked that renewable energy is a thing that we need to have. Making leadership work. Cy Weiss, Sierra Club, thank you so much for coming down. Thanks, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.